Hello, my friends. This video is the English version of the lesson taught by Hermann Lombo. This video is the second part of the cardiology lesson, Anatomy of the Heart, and above is the link to the first video, so that you can catch up and properly understand this second part. But, as a brief summary, I'll remind you that we looked at the following points. First, we gave an overview of the heart to understand its structure and general functions. Second, we looked at the location of the heart. We established that it is situated in the inferior mediastinum, specifically in the middle mediastinum. Third, we discussed the pericardium and the layers of the heart. We studied the pericardium, the fibrous membrane which covers the heart. And what's more, using Lego, we learnt about the different layers of the pericardium, as well as the layers which form the walls of the heart. And finally, we defined the four chambers of the heart, the septa which separate these, and the relationship between these chambers and the blood vessels, whether these be arteries or veins, via which blood is received or expelled. So, now we are ready to continue our lesson by looking at the valves of the heart. So let's expand our knowledge. I'll begin. Valves of the heart. So now our heart structure is a little more complete. But look, in white we highlight some details, which are found between the chambers and between the vessels and the chambers. These elements represent the valves of the heart. The valves work by controlling the flow of blood and prevent, for example, blood returning to the cavity it originated from, thus ensuring a unidirectional flow of blood. Broadly speaking, there are two types of valves that you should know about, the AV valves and the semilunar valves. The AV, or atrioventricular valves, can be found between the atria and the ventricles, and the semilunar valves are those which are found between the ventricles and the vessels. Here is a breakdown of the AV valves. First, the tricuspid valve, which regulates the flow between the atrium and the right ventricle. Then, we have the mitral valve, which regulates the flow between the atrium and the left ventricle. In contrast, the sigmoid valves, or semilunar valves, can be described as follows. The pulmonary valve, that regulates the flow between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. And the aortic valve, that regulates the flow between the left ventricle and the aorta. To put it simply, the valves operate by alternating between an open and a closed state. Note that, in this case, the mitral valve is open, allowing blood to flow to the left ventricle, while the aortic valve is closed. The aortic valve then opens to allow the blood to flow out of the ventricle, whilst the mitral valve is closed. Let's go over this process so that we can fully understand how the valves work. First, blood goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle, passing through the tricuspid valve. Second, blood goes from the right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk, passing through the pulmonary valve. Third, blood goes from the left atrium to the left ventricle, passing through the mitral valve. Fourth, Blood goes from the left ventricle to the aortic artery, passing through the aortic valve. It is worth noting that the structure and operation of the valves will be examined in much greater detail in our internal configuration video. So, based on the route that the blood follows, we can describe the concepts of minor or pulmonary circulation or major or systemic circulation. Pulmonary circulation moves blood between the heart and the lungs. It begins in the right ventricle and takes poorly oxygenated blood to the lungs for hematosis to occur. The oxygen-rich blood then flows from the lungs back to the left atrium. Meanwhile, systemic circulation moves blood between the heart and the rest of the body. It begins in the left ventricle, sending oxygenated blood out to the different organs and tissues and returning deoxygenated blood to the right atrium through the venous system. Arrangement of the chambers and faces of the heart. Now, one of the things that most confuses students 
is understanding the spatial layout of the heart and its different chambers. On the left hand side, you will see some cubes which represent the four chambers, and we will use these to facilitate the understanding of this section. The cubes represent the right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, and left ventricle. First of all, we have to understand that the heart is not vertical. Rather, it is inclined slightly to the left. And secondly, you should know that the chambers are not arranged in a perfect parallel shape, one next to another. Rather, there is an overlap, in which the right-hand chambers are located slightly in front of the left-hand ones. If we look at the images of the right half seen from the front, we will mainly see the right-hand chambers, that's to say, the right atrium and the right ventricle. And if we take a left, lateral viewpoint, we can see how the right ventricle clearly overlaps the left ventricle. And we can see the left atrium better. This is key to understanding the different sides of the heart, which we will study next. The heart is classically described as a pyramid, in which the tip, called the apex, is pointed forwards, left and downwards, whilst the base of the pyramid is pointed backwards, right and upwards. Regarding the different surfaces of the heart, it is important to mention that different sources cite the heart as having three, four or six surfaces, depending on the author and their approach. In this case, we will describe the heart as having four surfaces, since it greatly facilitates the general understanding of the subject. In this case, the heart will have an apex, a base and four surfaces, an anterior surface, an inferior surface, a right pulmonary surface and a left pulmonary surface. The anterior surface is mainly represented by the right ventricle, with a contribution from the right atrium and the left ventricle. The left pulmonary surface is mainly represented by the left ventricle, with a contribution from the left atrium. The right pulmonary surface is mainly represented by the right atrium. The inferior surface is represented mainly by the left ventricle and the right ventricle. The base is represented mainly by the left atrium and part of the right atrium. And the apex is represented by the tip of the left ventricle that, as we mentioned, in normal conditions points downwards and to the left. But does the heart always point to the left? Well, no. One of the most interesting congenital anomalies that we can study is dextrocardia a condition in which the heart points in the opposite direction, that's to say, towards the right-hand side of the chest, bearing in mind that dextro means right. In this case, we can observe the famous electrocardiogram. Above, we can see a completely normal EKG. But below, we see an electrocardiogram of a patient with dextrocardia, in which you can clearly observe that practically all of the leads are inverted. And if you can't see it clearly, don't worry, in another video we will explain electrocardiography so that you can understand it better. External details Now let's continue describing the external details of the heart by highlighting three features. 1. The atrial appendages. 2. The borders. And 3. The grooves. The atrial appendages are extensions derived from the atria. Imagine that an atrium is a house and the appendage is an annex. From an external viewpoint, it looks as though they are hugging the large vessels. The right appendage is connected to the aorta and the left appendage to the pulmonary trunk. Regarding the borders, we can describe four. A right border, delimited by the right atrium. An inferior border, delimited by the right ventricle. A left border, delimited by the left ventricle, and a superior border, connected to the appendages and the large vessels. Finally, to finish today's lesson, we will indicate the grooves, or sulci, of the heart. As far as external configuration goes, we can define a set of grooves which function as important anatomical landmarks, and that generally coincide with the paths of the veins and the arteries of the heart. We therefore have an anterior interventricular sulcus, a posterior interventricular sulcus, 
an interarterial sulcus, and the coronary sulcus. As their names indicate, interventricular sulci externally delimit the point of separation between the right ventricle and the left ventricle, and these grooves are related to the anterior and posterior insertion of the interventricular septum. Likewise, the anterior interventricular sulcus connects with the posterior interventricular sulcus at the level of the apex. In a similar way, we find the interarterial sulcus delimiting the separation between the two atria. It is worth noting that we usually observe this groove from behind, when we are located in relation to the base of the heart. In the case of the coronary sulcus, it surrounds the heart like a kind of crown, which is interrupted on the anterior face at the level of the large vessels. Thus, the confluence of the posterior interventricular sulcus the interarterial sulcus and the coronary sulcus from the right and the left form the crux cordis, or crux of the heart, which is cross-shaped. But how are the coronary vessels related to these courses? In the anterior interventricular sulcus, we can find the anterior or anterior descending interventricular artery and the great cardiac vein. In the posterior interventricular sulcus, we can find the posterior interventricular artery, also called the posterior descending artery, and the middle cardiac vein. And finally, in the coronary sulcus, we find the circumflex artery and the coronary sinus on the left, and on the right, we find the coronary artery and the minor cardiac vein. And this brings today's lesson to a close. If you liked our class, don't forget to share it with your friends, leave a comment and subscribe to the channel so that we can continue learning together in the future. See you in the next video. Goodbye.